My gentle and, of course, very modern apes, I have a petty little tale for you today. In many ways, this video is unnecessary, but I am going to go ahead and make it, and I'm going to give it to you because I think it highlights the current state of a very particular brand of pseudoscience. I am, of course, talking about Young Earth Creationism. Staring today, aren't we? Shocker, I know. But you did click on this video, and I know for a fact that the whole YEC thing is in the title, so in a way, in a way this is your fault. We're going to be chatting a little bit about the relationship between amateur Young Earth creationists here on YouTube and the guests that they have on. These guests range in both their subject of study and, of course, the focus of the video. But one thing that is very important to note, and a very common trend that myself and others have noticed, is that they're rarely invited on to talk about their own field of expertise. This goofy little trend extends to the professional organizations as well, as Georgia Purdom, who is of course a geneticist by training, is very comfortable getting up on stage at Answers in Genesis and waxing poetic about geology. This is called Engineer's Canyon. It's 1 40th the scale of the Grand Canyon. It was cut out in nine hours. That's all it took, right? It just took a catastrophe. Now, there's a little um, river that runs through that canyon. And I'm going to tell you right now, that river didn't make that canyon, right? Because we know. We observed it in the present. It just took nine hours to carve that out. Now, I would say the same is true for the Grand Canyon. Except Engineer's Canyon is significantly smaller and made of entirely different materials. Volcanic materials, which are easily carved away when compared to the solid rock of the much larger Grand Canyon. This is something that Georgia might know if she were a geologist. This is very strange because in the world of conventional science, you would be hard-pressed to find anyone who's willing to speak outside their subdiscipline. As we all know, getting your PhD is to highly specialize in a given area. Of course, you have your general training too. But because of this, folks who study, say, the mating systems of polar bears aren't going to make a peep about the mating systems of brown bears unless they've done the research and study themselves on that species unless they've had time to peruse the literature first. And this is because they are, well, responsible and professional researchers and educators. However, because there is a famine of young earth creationist PhDs, the folks at AIG are stretched pretty thin. Today, however, we are going to be discussing this phenomena in the context of the amateur YECs, the grassroots Young Earth creationists. Because at an organizational scale, you know, with vetted lecturers and lectures, the problem is easier to ignore. They can always edit it, or they can always not actually release these interviews with the gaffes, right? However, here on YouTube, something very different happens, and we end up with a fascinating train wreck of dissenting opinions, embarrassing on-camera mistakes, and ultimately it betrays the dangers of invoking an authority that has no authority. So, strap in, goobers.
It seems like every creationist has something to say about geology. Geneticists, mechanical engineers, multiple Indiana Jones cosplayers, and of course domestic abusers all seem to have some hidden expertise in the subject. The actual creationist geologists, like Andrew Snelling or Steve Austin, do chime in, although it should be noted that at least in the case of Dr. Andrew Snelling, his conventional work is surprisingly conventional. I think geology is so appealing to the average creationist lacking formal training in the subject because it seems intuitive, it seems easy. Far from it, but we'll get to that later. We have three topics to briefly discuss. The heat problem, the Castile formation, and the Green River formation. The way that we're going to do this is we are going to briefly at lightning speed discuss the issue, we will look at how the amateur typically copes with the issue, we'll look at who they bring on to tackle it as an authority figure, and then we will discuss how that authority figure manages. The reason I describe this video as petty is because the channel that we're tackling is not a huge fan of me as an individual. Um, they have, rough estimate, maybe 50 videos about me, which is fine. I'm not concerned at all. Now close the door and test the deadbolt to make sure it aligns. And I know what you're thinking, guts it given, <laughs> you're doing it again, you're covering channels that you said you weren't going to cover anymore, um, and you're right, I'm weak. It's just, this channel is like a great big bonfire of ineptitude, right? A generator of ignorance and general stupidity. And I am just a gigantic moth drawn to, <laughs> drawn to this beaming, this beacon. But this is relevant. A year or so ago, I made a video about the heat problem, an OKO, or one-hit knockout for those of you who don't game as hard as I do, to young Earth creationism. The problem works something like this. Essentially, in order to explain why all our radiometric dates show the Earth to be very old, young Earth creationists suggest that during the flood of Noah, something very radical happened in the realm of physics that caused radiometric decay, remember that law in physics from earlier, to accelerate by several orders of magnitude. This would allow them to stand by an Earth that is 6,000 years old, despite much older universal nuclear dates. There are several problems with this, but the big one is that nuclear decay releases heat. So cramming 4.5 to 4.8 billion years of heat release into one year results in enough heat to vaporize the granitic crust of the planet several times over, something a wooden boat obviously would not survive because the planet would essentially be a ball of plasma goo. But accelerating decay also leads to 4.5 to 4.8 billion years of radiation being released, which would certainly destroy all life on Earth down to the smallest microbe, and also, of course, everything on Noah's boat. Unfortunately, the problem gets worse. You see, Answers in Genesis proposes that all the tectonic plates also move to their current position during the single year of the Flood, adding even more heat due to the friction of continents moving at race car speeds atop the mantle. Additionally, impact events must all occur during this year, which adds enough heat on its own to nearly boil the world's oceans. All of this combined, of course, is the heat problem, and depending on what Flood model is being proposed, leads to either enough heat to vaporize the granitic crust of the Earth several times over at minimum, and at maximum is equivalent to 5,000 trillion 1 megaton hydrogen bombs for a total of 2.2 times 10 raised 38 ergs of energy. Answers in Genesis subscribes to the model yielding that smaller amount of heat, but admits that at present, it requires a miracle from God to fix. Now, I'm not the one who came up with this issue, but I did try to popularize it on YouTube with a video that summarizes the issue. Naturally, the amateur YECs went ballistic. 
Now, the pros, as I have mentioned many times on this channel, recognize that this heat problem is a real issue for their model. They are, as they say, trying to solve the problem, but they will readily admit that there is no current solution to it. This further enrages the petulant amateur. So in response to my video, we proceeded to get over 10 videos debunking the heat problem over the past year or so, each being labeled as the final decimation of the issue. The issue that has not been solved by the folks who have formal education in the subject. Note that each title is the last word on the issue, and that there are a lot of them. Every video is the last word on the issue. This is because after many of these videos, myself or more qualified individuals like Jordan, a nuclear physicist who runs the Reasons to Doubt podcast, chimed in with a reason that their proposed solution to the heat problem does not work. For instance, here are our apish hosts discussing how they can solve the heat problem by a number of different means. Ooh, look how easy it is and any other heat that's just dumped into space. Now, anybody can look to the hypercane model. Anybody can look to the massive amount of water that would have been on the Earth, miles and miles of water that would have been on the Earth at the time of the global flood that could have shielded NOAA, shielded the arc animals from the excess radiation and the heat. Okay, and the fact that these supersonic steam jets would have taken most of the heat up into space, all these number of solutions, okay? They can make assumptions, okay? And um, come up with some numbers Ooh, number one, that's usually the response someone gives when they are not very good at math. How dare you bring numbers into a physics problem? But number two, most of the heat problem numbers as far as how much heat is being released come from creationists, and this goes for both CPT and Walt Brown's hydroplate. You know what? I don't... I... N we didn't say that, uh, no, but it it looks an awful lot like that, it doesn't, does, it? doesn't it? Right? Add yeah. in the hypercane model. No, I just said add a canopy. Add, add, right. add limestone formation. Add oil. The ocean itself. I mean, there's multiple things. And then here is my pal Jordan, nuclear physics guy I mentioned earlier, discussing the issue with this Olympic-level hand-waving. Jordan begins by telling us how much heat could be removed by hypercanes jettisoning up all this thermal energy into space. The hypercane model. But then he does something even cooler, and I'll just let you see it for yourself. All we have to do is find out how much rain the storm dropped over its area and for how long. Multiply that by the latent heat of condensation, and that gives us the heat it rejected. So let's do it. All I have to do is fill out these variables and we'll be done. First up, the amount of rainfall. According to the NOAA, that's the government agency that tracks hurricanes, your average hurricane drops one and a half centimeters of rain per day over its area. The Institute for Creation Research says that hypercanes drop 10 times more rainfall than a hurricane. So let's give our hypercanes 50 times more water than a normal hurricane, a mega hypercane, if you will. Next, the area of the storm. Now, I'm not sure what the area is. Um, Estimates vary, but I can tell you what it definitely was not more than, the entire surface of the Earth. So we are going to go wall-to-wall hypercanes. Finally, the duration of the storm. According to Genesis, there was heavy rain for 40 days, light rain for 150 days, then no rain for the remaining part of the year as things dried out. Now, we could say the heavy rains are hypercanes, and but maybe the light rains are hypercanes too. I mean, light is a relative term. But let's just cut straight to the chase. We're going to go year-long hypercanes 24-7, 365. Can't get more than that. So plugging all those numbers in, we get a total heat dissipation from the hypercanes, and it is a lot of heat. Unfortunately, that heat, which is 3.15 times 10 to the 26 joules, only represents 0.02% of the heat that needs to be rejected. We still have 99.98% of the heat remaining. Despite the Earth's year-long mega hypercane bonanza, the thermometer has not budged. Oh, well, looks like the hypercanes aren't going to work, but they're not working on their own, right? The whole heat problem is solved by a bunch of random stuff, all removing the heat at once, like at least two dozen things, right? But what about the other heat rejection methods? I mean, they've got more than one, right? Well, for the sake of time, uh, let's say we just came up with a bunch of other methods, and each and every one was just as powerful as the gold standard souped-up mega wall-to-wall -wall hypercanes. How many methods would we need? Well, here's what the temperature looks like after applying 100 hypercane equivalent methods. Here's what it looks like after 1,000. Let's just cut to the end. 
Here it is after 4,500 separate methods, each and every one pr reducing the heat by as much as all these souped up mega hypercanes. All of that gets us to the temperature equal to the surface of the sun. The Earth is still completely melted, the oceans have long since vaporized, etc. Unfortunately, our undereducated underdogs don't seem to have cracked the case just yet. But maybe they can fall back on some more academic fraud, eh? It's also worth noting that everyone brought on to talk about this topic isn't even tangentially related to the field of focus, which is, of course, nuclear physics. We have the astronomer Jason Lyle, the late and hateful radio host show Bob Enyart, and the maybe paleobiologist Joseph Hubbard. And all of them note that there is also not currently a solution to the issue. Do you think that this accelerated nuclear decay would have caused what they, what they deem as the heat problem? They said, you know, this... this uh convection and the uh, the subduction plates would have caused so much heat generated during this nuclear uh, process that the heat the oceans would have boiled. Have you heard of this? You know, have you yes, I've heard of that. Yes. Um, I, I haven't seen um, a detailed uh, study on that other than uh, I have, there are ways to dump the heat. First of all, you do, you need heat. You need heat to start the flood. So that's not a bug, that's a feature. <laughs> uh, to get the plates moving, they need energy and an acceleration of radioactive decay, that's a great way to start plates moving, uh, to heat them up to where they can be hot enough, where they could be almost a, not quite a liquid state, but it makes them more uh, malleable. Uh, where did the heat go? Well, we don't know. We, first of all, we don't know what the Earth's temperature was in, in the core, for example, before the flood year. What if a lot of that energy is now, what if it's still there, what's still in the core? A lot of the energy could have gone into that. A lot of the energy could, be, could have been dumped to space. There have been uh, creationist models of uh, hypercanes, for example, which is like a hurricane, but on a much more massive scale. There are other explanations for that. Um, I don't have the numbers with me to see, you know, which of these is the most plausible, but. Um, I don't have the numbers with me to see. Um, I don't have the numbers. But there are some possibilities right there. So certainly it's not a, a knockdown drag out argument against a uh, accelerated decay because it produces heat. That's a feature. We need some heat to start the flood. And as long as you can dump at the space fast enough, you're going to be fine. Right. That was, uh, that was a really good answer. Probably one of the best I've heard on that. Um... Look, Pim, I know it's our job to help this guy and everything, but I think this guy's a lost cause. He's obviously made up his mind. Why don't we just cut our losses and get out of here? So I, I, I won't say that we can just easily or, or uh, you know, easily solve the heat problem for hydroplate theory, if you, if you want to call it a heat problem, in terms of having some summation of numbers that just gives us an absolute, oh, this is solved, right? But um, they'll say that these catastrophic processes during the flood, the, the fountains of the great deep breaking open, catastrophic plate tectonics, for example, they'll, mm -hmm. see, they'll assert that, that a tremendous amount of heat is being produced from these processes that it would preclude a global flood because this heat would boil the oceans essentially melt mm -hmm. the crust and kill noah in the ark to do the, ra the radiation I, I know there's a lot of creation scientists working on this so it's mm -hmm. probably um a question that could take a couple hour lecture yeah you know in, of itself but i'm curious what what are your <clears throat> thoughts on, on that objection that, that they okay um the uh you are right there's no one quick answer that i can just spill out and it's definitive right. and, and positive but then that's that's fine that's not a problem um there's so many <clears throat> problems from a secular point of view with deposition and so on and so forth anyway as in you wouldn't physically get what we see around us if it was so um that uh, there's going to be objections and issues on the creationist side as well and the flood the, the flood heat problem as it's known is a real problem it's a genuine problem and like you say, there are many creationists working on it, so... And yet, with every subsequent guest that's more educated than the host noting that the problem is unsolved, we get another video claiming that not only is the problem solved, but it has been epically owned, or whatever it is that, like, fifth grade TikTokers say these days. You just got brutalized! I just epically owned you in the marketplace of ideas, ideas, ideas. But despite being destroyed numerous times over, we get the latest expert, McQueen, coming on and telling us that he and his buddy George are working on it. Tube, which illustrates heat coming up from the B-L-O-B, -B, the blob. Uh, 
the George and I uh, will continue to work all during the month of November on the mathematics of this. So not quite solved, but it, at least their mechanism involves blobs, I guess? It really doesn't matter. Jordan came on the channel a while back to discuss this proposed mechanism by McQueen and company, and essentially, in order for the mantle to draw heat down into it, because of the laws of thermodynamics, the mantle has to actually be colder than the surface of the Earth, implying that the surface of the Earth was hotter than the mantle at the time of Noah's flood, even under their own heat mitigation model. There is a lot of vague gesturing to solutions, but no numbers, which is kind of the point of an empirical problem. Contrast this to the math done by Jordan, friend of the channel, who definitively precludes each attempt put forward at solving the problem, from hypercanes to these mysterious blobs that McQueen seems on about. It's just, it's kind of weird, right? It, this feels very much like uh, my girlfriend goes to another school or she lives in Canada. Like, if you've got the solution, put up or shut up, right? Or, you know, just keep trying, right, boys? I'm, I'm sure that you'll solve what the PhD geologists and physicists couldn't. We are looking into facts, and those facts we do not have, but we're looking into them because we want to know what we don't know. And there is so much that we don't know. But there are also things that we know. And we know things. We know a lot of things. And we also don't know a lot of things. So it's important to be mindful of the things that we know versus the things that we don't know and weigh the options. Because the things that we don't know impact the things that we know and the things that we know change on a daily basis based on the things that we don't know as we know them. So when we go to the future, the more we know, the more we learn, the more we do better. But we can't do better until we know those things. So if we don't know the things that we know now, how do we get to a place where we can know the things that we need to know in the future so that we can know them right now and stop the things that we know? Well, I've compiled a list. Here's what we know. Nothing. Another funny thing to note is the constant flip-flopping between these flood models, right? As previously mentioned, there are two main contributors to the heat problem. There is CPT, or catastrophic plate tectonics, held by most of the big organizations to, in order to get the continental plates where they are today during Noah's flood. And then there's hydroplate. And both models are very silly, and they both release way too much heat. But they also directly contradict each other. So here's good old Bob Enyart explaining why catastrophic plate tectonics is stupid and bad in favor of his hydroplate idea. And then after that, we'll see Michael Ord, another creationist, explain why hydroplate is stupid and bad and why catastrophic plate tectonics is actually much better. CPT says that the physical laws were somehow altered by God to cause the events of the flood to unfold. So that's our CPT miracle number one. And if you're gonna change the physical laws supernaturally, then you might as well not have a scientific model because you can't test it. Because every problem is solved by a miracle. Uh, a neat friend of mine, Phil Budd here in Denver, uh, Phil Budd calls these miracles of convenience. Whenever your model has a problem, say that there was a miracle and that solves it. So, well, the next question in line is, is what do I think about the hydroplate theory? Yes. Uh, not much. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I've examined it. In fact, I have a 10,000 or more word article on the CMI website, 2013, yes. that I, where I examined a lot of that stuff. Um, I, I think he believes that most or all the asteroids and comets are from the fountains of the great deep shooting material up into the space. Now, Faulkner especially has developed that. Uh, it's, uh, I think in 2013 also, um, he's gone into that, Faulkner being an astronomer, uh, delving into that and show that that couldn't possibly uh, be the case. But anyway, you have problems having to escape the gravity of the Earth, major problems. He brings up some suggested mechanisms, which I've talked to people about some of these, like a, a water hammer that make no sense and, and couldn't do it. So anyway, to make a long story short, I have 
serious problems with uh, his idea. The smooth-brained amateur cannot commit to a model, for to commit is to be open to refutation. Next, we can talk about the experts, the, the experts that the amateurs bring on to talk about two big, very problematic geologic formations. As a fun note here, when I decided to stop talking about this channel, I also decided not to use the name of the channel in my videos so as to not give them unnecessary algorithmic attention. And as a result, I have become the critic who shall not be named. One specific uh, person who shall remain nameless. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about? Mimicry, they say, is the most sincere form of flattery. A while back, I had PhD geologist Dr. Kevin Hinkey on my channel, and then again shortly after. We discussed the problematic nature of two geologic formations, known as the Castile Formation and the Green River Formation. Naturally, the amateur must respond, and naturally, he had completely unqualified people on to refute Dr. Hankey. Now, you might be thinking, Erica, <laughs> gutsy gibbon, these people are highly formally educated in some way. Are you really saying that they can't talk about a discipline that they didn't get formal training in, even though they have a PhD in something else? And the answer to that is yes, kind of. Now, scientists speak all the time about areas that are outside of their realm of expertise. Like I said earlier, getting a PhD or a postdoc, anything like that, tends to involve hyper-specialization, but it also involves a broader education of related areas. However, in the real world, when a scientist is talking outside of their area of expertise, so our polar bear mating specialist is talking about brown bear mating, they first note that they are doing so. Then they cite the research that they are using to bolster their talk or their point. And most importantly of all, they don't mess up the basics because they are professionals and have prepared ahead of time because they know that they're talking outside of their normal discipline. They're also not trying to overturn a paradigm, right? You don't get to speak outside of your field, cite almost nothing and misrepresent the citations that you do use to bolster your claim, get the basics wrong when discussing this field that you are not an expert in, and expect to overturn the paradigm. Sorry. So who did our amateur have on to discuss these geologic formations to overturn the entire paradigm of an ancient earth? Well, a guy with an undergraduate degree in geology, an airplane engineer, and a retired meteorologist. And it shows. Let's begin with the Castile Formation. As a refresher, this formation is found in West Texas and Southeast New Mexico and is a part of the larger Delaware Basin. The former is around 550 meters thick and the latter 7.3 kilometers thick and they cover a distance of 113 kilometers of land. The Castile Formation is composed of 209,000 varves or layers of sediment that necessarily form by a cyclic process that is annual in nature, such as the seasons. Conveniently, the Castile Formation is known to have formed as a result of yearly evaporation cycles during the ancient Permian summers over the course of around 209,000 years. The formation is also very well understood in its composition due to rampant petroleum exploration in the area over the past 100 years. Dr. Kevin Hankey, PhD geologist, has been on this channel and outlined a fantastic presentation on the Castile Formation, whose link you can find in the description. He did a fantastic job presenting the issues that it creates for young earth creationism, both due to its composition and its size. Dr. Hinkey noted that young earth creationists have about a year for the flood to create the entire geologic column, including the Castile Formation and the larger Delaware Basin it is found within. 
Because the Castile Formation is composed of 209,000 varves, each varve having a calcite portion and an anhydride portion, creationists must explain how we get 418,000 chemically distinct layers. If we allow them to form the entire 7.3 kilometer thick Delaware Basin in just five days and give them 365 days for just the much smaller Castile Formation, each layer has only 75 seconds by which it can form and then cover over a distance of 113 kilometers, which means it needs to be moving at speeds of over 2,696 kilometers per hour underwater while staying chemically consistent. Not scientifically possible! So instead, creationist guests like Steph Harima propose that the Castile Formation is magmatic in origin. So instead of forming via long cycles of evaporation in an ancient water body, Mr. Harima proposes that volcanoes made it. As silly as that sounds, I promise it's actually even sillier in the details. Even sillier than the time that Mr. Harima forgot the difference between volcanic and intrusive igneous rocks. Now, in order to be magmatic in origin, Mr. Harima must show that several geologic formations that are diagnostic of this kind can be found at Castile while explaining away others that we see there already. Magmatic origin, for instance, would require the presence of feeder dikes, as well as the diagnostic characteristics of classic igneous formation. It would also require an explanation for the isotopic signals within Castile that indicate a marine origin, for the presence of organics, including oil and planktonic remains within calcite, and a means by which magma can deposit 418,000 layers that are chemically distinct and fluctuate temperature requirements between each layer. Lastly, a magmatic origin would require that any magmatic layering process duplicates the 1800 to 3000 year mineralogical cycle that we see consistently throughout the Castile Formation. This is a monumental task. So how did Mr. Harima, airplane engineer, fare? Well, it didn't go well. Harima calls on a magmatic layering process known as fractional crystallization to explain the layering in the Castile Formation, but he never provides any evidence for how this process could explain that 1800 to 3000 year mineralogical cycle that we see constantly fluctuating and repeating throughout the formation, despite it being brought to his attention multiple times. It's one thing to claim that salt magmas could make some kind of layering. It's another thing entirely to say that salt magmas can mimic layering with such specific consistent cycling according to things like the seasons. A sedimentary origin, however, has no problem explaining this. Then there's the issue of how magma can deposit these fine layers in an alternating fashion across 113 kilometers of land. And there is the issue of the present calcite being marine, which is only possible under evaporation in a marine environment, unless Harima knows of some magma-loving plankton that we haven't heard of. As support for his feeder dikes, Harima points to fault lines in the area and speculates that any one of these could be his necessary dikes. Fault lines are of course commonly associated with feeder dikes, but wherever a fault is a feeder dike, it also shows association with other diagnostic characteristics, such as magmatic remnants and contact metamorphism. So if any of these faults are in fact the feeder dikes that he needs, they should show such traces. But Harima provides no support for the presence of all these diagnostic characteristics to back up this baseless speculation. Remember again that the Castile Formation is like a hot area for the petroleum industry and for petroleum exploration, which is also how we know that it's of sedimentary origin and not magmatic origin. So Mr. Harima attempts to counter this by utilizing a quote from Scholl et al. Quote, in spite of all this research, few areas have more unresolved geological controversies than the Permian Reef complex, unquote. It should not surprise you that this is indeed a quote mine, because immediately following this mine is the following. Quote, every single one of the facies represented in the spectrum of basinal to far back reef settings has evoked a variety of opinions as to its origin or significance. Thus, Although the overall environmental framework of facies is generally agreed upon, much work remains to be done on specifics interpretations. Ooh, this is a YEC classic, ladies and gentlemen. 
take the minutia of a field and show that they are up for debate and then just use it as support for the idea that the very basics of that field are also up for debate. That the Castile Formation is a sedimentary formation and that it is an ancient Permian Reef complex is not up for debate. Harima fares no better at explaining away the presence of marine isotopic ratios. Isotopic ratios are recorded in rocks and can diagnose the environment that the rocks were formed in. In the case of the Castile Formation, layers are shown to be isotopically marine. Harima instead implies that these ratios are the result of contamination by groundwater after formation. This is simply not something that can happen, and Harima would be aware of this were he a geologist and not an airplane engineer. As Kirkland et al. explains, samples which have undergone isotope exchange should not align with estimates for original Permian seawater, which were calculated completely independently, or show concordant readings with such a large number of samples. Isotope exchange with the groundwater, especially over a large area, should result in discordance of readings between a large number of the samples. Oil is another big problem, since oil degrades to CO2 and or graphite under temperatures greater than 200 degrees Celsius, which would of course be every magma. If Castile really is a magmatic formation, there should be no oil at all, yet it is comparatively abundant. The oil simply must have formed under non-magmatic conditions. But Harima tries to get around this by claiming that all the oil in Castile is secondary, having been drawn up from lower formations after his salt magmas cooled. But the problems with this are twofold. First of all, it misunderstood the original argument of Henke and Reinford back in 2020. Harima argues that heat from molten salt forms oil. Actually, petroleum forms a very stable regional geothermal gradient. How would molten magmas produce the widespread and consistent thermal conditions throughout the Delaware Basin necessary to produce petroleum? There can be no secondary oil in the first place without such a geothermal gradient. Secondly, Height and Anders back in 1991 discuss oils they retrieve from laminated anhydrite cores of the Castile Formation. While Height and Anders admit that they are hesitant to claim that all of the oil in the Castile Formation is indigenous, because there is indeed evidence of oil migration up from the underlying Bell Canyon Formation, their samples did not chemically resemble oils from the underlying Bell Canyon Formation. In other words, it is likely that at least some of the oil in the Castile Formation is derived from indigenous carrigens. Of course, any indigenous oil is fatal to a magmatic origin, as carrigens simply could never survive the heat of a magma. A good friend of myself and Dr. Henke, geology student Mr. Wilford, you've seen him here on the channel before, has outlined these issues in far, far greater detail in a long-form blog post that can be found in the description. Mr. Harima has seen this piece, and he has informed us that he will get around to responding to it sometime in the next year. He's definitely working on it, guys. Trust me. Michael Ord and John McKay have also attempted to discuss Dr. Hankey's other presentation on my channel, which was on the Green River Formation. When our meteorologist friend Ord discusses the Green River Formation, he repeatedly argues against the presence of genuine varves, which Dr. Hankey has already addressed in his original presentation. No rebuttals to these counterarguments were presented. Ord also repeated arguments against a lake environment being present in the Green River Formation, something other YECs with actual geology degrees like John Whitmore believed these formations were indeed produced in. However, Ward completely ignored the rebuttals to all of these arguments, which were presented by Whitmore himself in 2006. This was all covered in Dr. Hickey's talk as well. It seems that Ward just didn't watch the presentation. McKay seemingly didn't either because he invokes local floods forming layers quickly as equivalent to varves generally, which again reflect seasonal cycles. We know this because they contain annual markers like pollen. How does a global flood deposit pollen only in every other layer over the course of a year? Well, it doesn't. We do owe Michael Ord a big thank you, though. You see, I hear a lot from our YEC amateur YouTube friends that testable predictions are the hallmark of good science. And like we said earlier, uh, the gold standard of science, especially for any working hypothesis, is to make testable predictions. Is the fact that this was a confirmed testable prediction, as you can see, it was confirmed 10 years after the prediction was made. That's the gold standard of science to show that, no, it's actually creationists that are the ones doing the, the gold standard of science and making testable predictions. So...
And here is Michael Ord's thoughts when being asked for examples of predictions in young Earth creationism. Yeah, I've, I've got a I've got a question. Um, we 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 talk a lot about the gold standard in science uh, here, Mike. Uh, that is um, the um, making the testable predictions. Uh, this is a question from uh, uh, Mr. Ryan Lloyd. He asks, "What are some future?" testable predictions in flood geology testable predictions oh, okay <laughs> so predictions oh. I mean I, I can I can do a lot of expectations but actual predictions I'd have to think about that because I I don't think about that at all, as far as flood geology and the Ice Age go. <sighs> that sucks. That's, uh, I mean... <laughs> there, there. Thank you. That's nice. When other subjects have expert guests of this amateur YouTube channel discussed, and how does it relate to their field of formal study? My dear viewer, my gentle, my modern Abe, I'm so glad you asked. Well, Michael Ord, who has a bachelor's and a master's in atmospheric science, talks about the Green River Formation, flood geology, transitional forms in evolution, ice ages, and the pre- to post-flood boundary. David McQueen, who has a bachelor's in geology and a master's in geology, spends a lot of time talking about chemistry, evolution, the Grand Canyon, limestone, South Africa, crystals, mountain building, Darwin, nuclear decay, impact events, the moon, discrimination of young earth creationists, and erosion. Charles Jackson spends time talking about carbon-14 dating, genetics, the Big Bang, and human evolution with his science education degree. Steph Harima, with his Bachelor's of Science in Aircraft Engineering, likes to talk about geology and the global flood. Joseph Hubbard, with a natural science degree in earth science and maybe paleobiology, discusses fossils, but also limestone and general flood stuff. McKay, who has supposedly a BS in geology, we're not sure, talks about intelligent design, orchids, fossils, salinity, and also limestone. Sarfati, with his bachelor's and PhD both in chemistry, discusses the global flood, blood types, abiogenesis, and evolution in general. Rob Carter has his bachelor's in marine biology and has talked about me before in an angsty blog and likes to chat about genetics and share his expertise on Neanderthals. Really the only one who even remotely stays in his lane is Lyle, who has a background in physics, astronomy, and a minor in mathematics. He got his PhD in astrophysics, and typically he's only talked about astronomy and related fields, so good on him. I may be missing some of the guests, but this is meant to be a general overview of a trend that I've noticed. Is it not really really weird that the frequency of talking so far outside of your discipline is so high in young earth creationism in particular. Why do these people, these PhDs, these experts not talk about how young earth creationism is evident in their own fields? But then I guess there were no airplanes in the Cambrian. I will leave you to ponder the implications, and you can let me know what you think in the comments, because I do read all of them. In summary, the heat problem, Castile formation, and Green River formation remain unsolved issues for young earth creationism, thanks in part to the sometimes honesty and sometimes ignorance of the guests on this case study channel. And so, my gentle, of course, very modern apes, remember, do your research, cite your sources, and remember, if you're having a guest over, make sure that that guest doesn't make you look like a bigger dingus.